Welcome to day three of the 2021 AMS Washington Forum meeting presented by the AMS Board on Enterprise Economic Development. We had a great mentoring and mingling with coffee sessions, so thank you to all of you that joined. And now we have an exciting lineup. Today's highlights include one of my favorite people, and that is uh, Dr. Dene Carlos. He's giving the student enterprise keynote on his career journey, science, policy, and leadership. Next, we will have a keynote by Dr. Amanda Lynch on science communication in challenging times. Next, we'll have a session on making weather, water, climate programs happen and perspectives from federal agency procurement leaders. Then a session on energy policy, science in the next decade, and also a, a special announcement on the hazard simplification effort that uh, the National Weather Service has been undergoing throughout the last few years. Before I kick it over to our AMS president-elect, I would like to go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's event. Continue to enter the sessions as you did for this one through the Join Now link on the online platform. If you're a panelist or moderator, please remember to enter your sessions through the customized link that you, that you received. Given the nature of this virtual meeting, we must all re-enter each session. I know it's frustrating, but it's the easiest way to make this all go smoothly. The Join Now links will be active 20 minutes before each scheduled start time. If you have trouble accessing these sessions or questions for the forum leaders, please email meetings at ametsoc.org. Regarding the content you see and hear over the next few days, there are certain sessions that may be modified Chatham House rule, but I just realized we don't have any more of those, I think, the rest of the time, so disregard. For Q&A, please kindly use the question section and uh, please do put questions. We've had a couple of sessions where it's actually been more quiet than I expected, so please don't be shy. Feel free to tweet throughout the event at hashtag AWF2021. Um, and reminder of conduct. We want to remind everyone about our policy and professional respectful conduct at our meetings. And it applies to all AMS related events, including virtual meetings. Let's ensure that we're graceful and that we're kind in all of our interactions. Now I'd like to introduce uh, someone that I've gotten to know recently uh, more closely and really enjoy, uh, and I think you're gonna enjoy hearing from him. This is Dr. Richard Clark, uh, who is our incoming AMS president elect. He's also the chair of the Department of Earth Sciences and professor of meteorology at Millersbury University. Uh, he also was a fellow and served as a member of AMS Council from 2008 to 2011 and several other AMS committees. He served two terms as the at-large member of the UCAR Board of Trustees and served on UCAR governance committees. His research interests span boundary layers and turbulence and air chemistry with a special emphasis on field observations and instrumentation using airborne and balloon-borne platforms. He recently completed a collaborative effort with NCAR and Comet to produce a 10 lesson interactive online course on atmospheric uh, instrumentation and measurement. What I really enjoy most about Rich is his dedication to the students and had the pleasure of working with him on the mentoring and mingling with pizza we held on Monday night. And his passion for the students, whether they're undergrad or graduate or postdoc is, is profound. And I'm so appreciative uh, to him, as, and I know that the community is as well. So without further ado, I'd like to kick it over to Rich Clark. Rich, you're up. Thank you, Jennifer. I trust that you can hear me. <clears throat> Greetings, everyone. Uh, it's appropriate then after Jen's introduction that I would start off with my first slide of students who had attended the uh, AMS Washington Forum in the past. I wanna thank you for the opportunity to serve the AMS community as your president elect. And I look forward to sharing the landscape with you as we emerge into the new normal. I've been participating in and bringing students to the AMS Washington Forum since the inception of our master's program in integrated scientific applications in 2012. Our mission, which is to prepare business ready scientists aligns well with the themes that we have here at the forum. I see the AWF as a watering hole, maybe an oasis is a better visual where the tribes that is partners with varied and sometimes mutual interest across sectors meet to examine and debate public policy issues and imperatives across the enterprise slide two, please. 
as the enterprise as an enterprise forum, there are big ticket items to consider. As you heard in the keynotes on Monday, the UN has proclaimed 2021 through 2030 as a decade of ocean science for sustainable development to support efforts to reverse the cycle of decline in ocean health and gather ocean stakeholders worldwide behind a common framework for sustainable development of the ocean. Scientific understanding of the ocean's responses to pressures and management actions is fundamental for sustainable development. The UN Decade of Ocean Sciences will help us build a shared information system based on trustworthy scientific data from all parts of the world's ocean and AMS is a principal ocean stakeholder. Slide three, please. The American Lung Association just released its 2021 State of the Air, which reports that despite some nationwide progress on cleaning up air pollution, mainly decreases in ocean uh, in uh, ozone levels, more than 40% of Americans, over 135 million people, are living in places with unhealthy levels of pollu pollution. The burden of living with unhealthy air is not shared equally as you might imagine. People of color all over are over three times more likely to be breathing the most polluted air than white people. Three year, the three years covered by the State of the Air 2021 ranked among the six hottest years on record globally. High ozone days, spikes in particle pollution, some related to extreme heat and wildfires, are putting millions more people at risk and adding challenges to the work that states and cities are doing across the nation to clean up air pollution. The AMS is a principal stakeholder in the air quality arena. Slide four, please. Extreme weather events such as tropical cyclones, floods, heavy rain, heat waves, and droughts impact many parts of the world. The 2020 Atlantic hurricane season witnessed 30 named storms which is the highest ever recorded. Earth's average temperature in 2020 tied that of 2016 for the hottest year on record, and the last seven years were the seven hottest on record. CO2 levels rose by 2.6 parts per million to, to 414 parts per million in 2020, despite a six to 7% global decline in CO2. Arctic sea ice reached its second lowest extent and volume ever recorded in 2020. Slide five, please. This is a busy slide and you probably can't read too much of it, but essentially it says that 2020 sets the new annual record for <clears throat> billion dollar events, $22 billion events shattering the previous annual record. Costs and frequency continue to increase. The Weather Research and Forecast Innovation Act of 2017 is an enterprise level act to prioritize weather research to improve weather data, modeling, computing, forecasts, and warnings for the protection of life and property and the enhancement of the national economy. Obviously, our community is, is a principal partner. Slide six, please. Dry lands are home to 2.1 billion people on are under heavy are under severe threat. They harbor some of the world's most valuable and rarest biodiversity. Dry lands make up 41.3% of land surface and about 44% of all world's cultivated systems are in the dry lands. Livelihoods of more than 1 billion people in some 100 countries are threatened by desertification. According to the UN habitat, 18 and a half percent population growth rate in the drylands was faster than in any other ecological zone. The catastrophic convergence of climate change, poverty, and violence is endemic to nearly one billion of the most marginalized people who live in the most vulnerable areas severely affected by desertification. Slide, slide seven, please. Space weather phenomenon and you know them, ge geomagnetic storms, solar radiation storms, solar radio bursts, cosmic rays, can have significant adverse impact on our nation's infrastructure from aviation operations, power grids, pipelines, orbital degradation of LEO satellites, radio communications, space operations, and more. By 2030, the global space industry could add almost 50,000 new commercial satellites to the existing 5,000. 
the ProSwift Act, promoting research and observations of space weather to improve forecasting of tomorrow is an enterprise level initiative to improve understanding and forecasting of space weather events and for other purposes. There's a 15 member uh, advisory group that has been recently created and the weather water climate community has a seat at that table. Slide eight, please. Common to each of these enterprise level initiatives is the generation of data. We observe, create, measure, simulate, collect, and process data at a prodigious rate propelled by modern digital technology and use it to create new knowledge and insights, inform and validate models and hypotheses, guide policies and decisions, and advance the scientific, environmental, and, and societal dimensions of the weather water climate enterprise. Data, data create a network of loci for interact, interlinking heterogeneous disciplines across the enterprise along braids of commonality to propel new science, expand and empower the stakeholder topography across all sectors and ameliorate bias and socioeconomic inequity all through the suff suffusion of data centric approaches to solutions. Data will drive scientific inquiry with modern digital sensors, Internet of Things sensors, remote sensing technology, and with the explosion of computing technologies, there's an emergence of new insights inviting inquiry and spawning innovation and discovery. Data can advance racial and socioeconomic justice, equity, access, and inclusion. Data are the foundation of evidence-based solutions needed to thwart the pernicious effects of systemic barriers to justice and equity across socio the socioeconomic landscape. Data can be used to identify unconscious and conscious bias, which can infect policies, programs, perspectives, algorithms on which autonomous options are sometimes decided. Data are transforming education and training and bridging disciplines. Technology, computation, and big data can be leveraged to develop, implement, and analyze educational interventions designed to prepare a diverse and equitable workforce, including exploring how students can integrate knowledge across disciplines to solve complex problems. Data are shaping environmental attitudes and behavior data are, used, are being used to identify human activities with the strongest environmental impact, where knowledge from the natural and the social sciences is integrated, which more adequately reflects the complex nature of most environmental problems. Data are braiding public-private partnerships. Partnerships can accomplish what neither can be done alone. Actionable weather, water, and climate information is key to developing successful strategies to address challenges facing society today, to develop and deliver cost if effective, to develop and deliver them cost effectively requires creative partnerships that draw on the strength of both private and uh, public sector. Data powers commercialization. Data fuels innovation and brings value and competitive advantage. Organization of meteorology increasingly reflects political economic approach that treats science as an economic entity in a market-based criteria that can allocate scientific resources. Environmental earth and space data have one of the largest digital footprints and are central components of scientific inquiry. Data are the buttress of hypothesis-driven science and substance of the inductive empirical investigation. In recent years, atmospheric, oceanic, climate, and hydrological data have come to be as much an asset as any natural resource. Databases and their derivatives and products have become increasingly valuable commodities, and the value proposition of data has grown. Nations of the world are revisiting arrangements to share data, improve data collection, drive research and innovation, stimulate R2O to R transfer, support education and training, and accommodate, accommodate commercialization. Big data is revolutionizing knowledge production by enabling novel, highly efficient ways to conduct research. The field of data science is creating new techniques for ext extrapolating knowledge and emergent discovery from data. 
the open data movement emerging from policy trends such as open government and open space encourage sharing data via digital infrastructures, which in turn can serve as scaffolding for development of artificial intelligence and an incentive for more efficient processing and knowledge creation. The research enterprise, along with private and government sectors, will lead the way in finding the acumen, resources, and technological prowess to effectively harness the data revolution to advance their imperatives, exploit emerging te technologies, and pursue frontiers. Still, as a community, we have a shared obligation to ensure that the next generation workforce is prepared for a world where data profoundly influences every facet of existence. Academic curricula must change to accommodate a new balance between foundational underpinnings in science and mathematics, the breadth of technical skills, cross-disciplinary competencies, and ethical wherewithal to use data responsibly for the common good. Slide nine, please. Finally, it is imperative that we ensure that data in all its forms and actions taken, sorry, Finally, it is imperative we, that, that we ensure that all data in, it, in its forms and actions taken based on that data are free of bias, racial, cultural, eth ethnic inequality, social, economic inequality and injustice, or anything that creates barriers, limits access and inclusion or diminishes diversity. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Rich. Heidi, I think I'm you just gonna, are. Yeah, I, 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 sorry, I was, I was just going to say, sorry. It's my pleasure to introduce Heidi Centola, who will moderate the next session and introduce our, our keynote speaker. As you all know, Heidi has been and continues to be a significant contributor to the AMS and the AMS Washington Forum. Go ahead, Heidi. Paul Rich, thank you for your kind words, and, and Jen, thanks for the intro earlier. I, I'm super honored and excited to be presenting our Enterprise Student Keynote, uh, kicking off day three, I believe uh, we were on, uh, Dr. Danae Carlos. And I was joking with Danae, thinking, man, I was going to read your bio, get all excited about introing him, and I go, wait, I'm going to totally steal your thunder. So I will just simply say, Please welcome to the virtual stage one of my favorite superheroes, Dr. Danae Carlos. Danae? Thank you, Heidi. I really appreciate this opportunity. I am elated. Ah, this is, this is a, a really big deal for me. So I really appreciate the opportunity. Um, I really want to kind of take you guys on a journey of my career. And so far, you know, I'm not at the end of it yet. But <clears throat> I think I've done some pretty interesting things that the students will will definitely align with and and hopefully understand a little bit about my career choices. Um, so I call it unscripted because I have no idea how I got here. Um, you know, I currently serve as the deputy director of the Global Systems Laboratory. But there's a lot of stuff in between, you know, where I am today versus where I started growing up in Oklahoma. Uh, and I like to share that with you all. And so you'll hear a mix of personal and professional stories uh, in this presentation today. And again, I really appreciate the opportunity to, to be able to present uh, at this particular forum that I've been attending since 2015. And so can we go to the next slide? So I was born and raised in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Uh, and I come from a very large and very supportive family. I was pretty shy kid when I was growing up, but I really enjoyed math and science. But my idea of what a scientist uh, actually look is or what it looked like was more something like an Einstein um, or some, something like a medical doctor. Uh, these were people or individuals that, you know, in some sense didn't look like me. And so I was really influenced as I continued uh, to progress as a, as a young person uh, by one of my best friends um, whose father 
was a scientist. Um, he was a medical doctor. He was African American. And he would tell me and my friends all kinds of stories about him doing chemistry experiments uh, in, the, in the laboratory as a high school student uh, at, in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and as a college student. And so it, it, it really piqued my interest and enamored me to see someone that I know that was really engaged on being a scientist. And so at the age of 16, I really started to get interested in college. Um, you know, I, I come from a lower uh, income uh, family. Uh, and so my only idea about college was that it would cost me money. And, you know, the <clears throat> having that background, I didn't really think that I would be able to afford to go to college. And so, my, but my mom told me, you know, Danae, you, you've done really well in school. You have really great grades. She said, God will make a way. And you put in the work to get the scholarships necessary for you to actually go to college. And so I, that's what I did. I, I went out and started applying to all kinds of scholarship uh, organizations. I mean, I received scholarships from the electric company, the gas company, anybody you could probably name, I probably got a scholarship from them. I also got a scholarship from John Stark's former uh, New York Knick basketball player who was from Tulsa, uh, who, who basically helped me with my college education. And so I say this because my grades were good, but my ambition for life, for success, for a career, it really wasn't there when I was at that, when I was at that age. And so a guy came to my school, uh, his name was Dr. Anthony Marshall. And he came to my marching band class and he talked about a university called Howard University in Washington, DC. Just imagine a kid from Tulsa, Oklahoma, the furthest I've ever traveled from Oklahoma is Texas. And so going to Washington, DC, he invited us to come to Washington, DC and visit Howard University. And I fell in love immediately when I visited the university. It was one of the most inspirational trips that I've ever had in my entire life. And so I went on to Howard University and I received a BS in chemistry. I received a master of science in atmospheric science while working at NASA. And then I got introduced to NOAA and I got into a, to a program called the Graduate Sciences Program, which is part of the NOAA Educational Partnership Program. And so I spent my PhD years in Honolulu, Hawaii, working as a student, but also working for NOAA um, and being a part of the NOAA Educational Partnership Program uh, for Minority Serving Institutions. And so I what I remember most about that time, especially in between going from Washington, D.C. to Hawaii, was the number of NOAA scientists that would come to Howard University and talk to us about about the about their research. I became enamored with numerical weather prediction at that particular time time. And I remember people like Jordan Alpert, people like uh, Dr. Steve Lord coming by the university and basically sharing with us what they do over in the National Weather Service Environmental Modeling Center. And that really inspired me uh, to to pursue a career in numerical weather prediction because I was fascinated by the fact that you could, you could, you could use computers in numerical simulations, you could use math and physics and all of the different things that we learned in school to actually predict the weather. And so I got into that particular program and I completed my dissertation, uh, graduating from Howard University in 2007. And you know, my, my passion really kind of for numerical weather prediction led me back to Washington, D.C., um, where, where I became a scientist, a research meteorologist at the Environmental Modeling Center, working on our global forecast system model. I did a lot of research to operations and uh, verification work in, in, in that particular 
um, in, in that particular time frame. And so I currently serve in Boulder, Colorado as the deputy director of the Global Systems Laboratory. I've been here since September of 2020, so a little bit around six months. And if you could hit hit the hit the click, yeah, you'll see some pictures of me uh, when I was a kid on the bottom left. I have to give out uh, give a shout out to the most popular um, uh, Kamala Harris, Vice President Kamala Harris, who is a graduate of Howard University. Uh, that's her on the yard. I spent a lot of time on that yard. Uh, she was there a little bit before me. Um, but I have to give a shout out to her for sure. And of course, uh, today we sit in our office, you know, mainly on video calls, uh, doing things like this, having a ton of meetings. And, but I'm, I'm really excited to be here in Colorado. And so, you know, what I've really learned throughout this particular journey is, you know, you, you can't let where you come from define where you go. And you can't, you, you have to understand that your career path isn't always going to be vertical like it's shown here. It, it, can, it can definitely not be this kind of upward trajectory. And so if you go to the next slide, it kind of introduces you to some of the positions that I've held um, within NOAA. You know, I started really focusing early on with my skills as a scientist uh, before moving into more policy and leadership positions. So I worked as the policy advisor to the NOAA chief scientist, uh, who was Dr. Rick Spinrad. And I'll tell you a story later on about Dr. Spinrad. Um, but I also worked as the policy advisor to the NOAA deputy administrator, um, who was Vice Admiral Manson Brown uh, from 2015 to 2016. Uh, at that particular point, the administration was changing, and I really want to stay stay in this particular role. So I transitioned to a weather portfolio advisor position here within OAR or NOAA Research is what we call it. Uh, so that's going from National Weather Service to another line office within NOAA, and then I became the pr a program manager uh, for the Forecasting and Continuum of Environmental Threats program. Uh, for the Next Generation Global Prediction System Program. And then I also became the program manager for the, the founding program manager for the Earth Prediction Innovation Center Program that was established in 2018, 2019. And that, of course, again, currently serving as the deputy director. And so when you look at that graphic on the right, um, so many different paths that you can take uh, to career success, it re it's, a career really isn't a destination, it's more of a journey uh, with so many different stops and turns along the way. Uh, the opportunities for advancements aren't always promotions. If you look at those green and orange um, uh, arrows, the, the, the green, of course, I moved up in my career, got promotions while I was a research meteorologist, but from 2014 to basically 2020, I took a lot of lateral moves, or more so horizontal moves, uh, to continue to uh, develop myself in uh, different areas where I felt uh, I needed to, to develop in, in order to progress my career. And so if you look at the, the middle portion of my career, I spent a lot of time learning about policy and, and attending meetings like this and, and also going to the AMS Summer Policy Colloquium. Uh, in order to figure out how to be a, a program manager and what that actually meant. I went to a program management boot camp so that I could learn more about that particular skill set. And of course, at some point in here, I'll talk about this later, I applied for the leadership development program that's within NOAA so that I could understand more about myself, who I am as a person, what's my leadership style and what's my leadership philosophy. And I'll talk a little bit about that later as well. So next, Next slide. I want to talk about, you know, being a meteorologist. And I know there's many of you, and I want to start with a, a little bit lighthearted and talk about some of the science that's, that's going on. But, you know, I'm sure you've all heard uh, of many of these examples of, of what society thinks about being a meteorologist. You've probably heard that being a meteorologist is easy, um, is, is as easy as looking up at the clouds. Your friends probably think that you're out chasing tornadoes. Um, your grandmother thinks that you're out studying meteors. 
Um, and then you have most people that ask, so what channel or TV station do you work for? I know I get that question all the time when I tell people that I'm a meteorologist. But in all actuality, you know, meteorologists are, have done very, very well in our math, physics, chemistry, uh, you know, all of the scientific courses that we take as meteorologists in order to attain that degree. We, we really are good in, in, at, at analytical thinking. And then for research meteorologists, you know, we're really, we're pretty good, decent computer scientists uh, and programmers. Uh, because many of us, if we haven't taken a course at our university, we basically self-taught our, we ha we've had to teach ourselves uh, pr programming languages like Fortran or Python or MATLAB. And so if you go to the next slide, uh, my career as a research meteorologist has been totally dependent on the amount of computing uh, that we do, that we use for our research. So that picture on the left is just of a used supercomputer. NOAA has these supercomputers all over the country. Uh, we never have enough supercomputers, supercomputing capacity, uh, especially on the research side. I know Louis talked about uh, the the research, the operational computing uh, jumps that we're making. We we still need to make those jumps on the research computing side. Uh, and then I, I want to make sure I give a plug for my organization. There's, there's only a few places out there where you can really go to be a research meteorologist. Um, and one of those places is the Global Systems Laboratory. So I encourage you all to look at our website. We have a lab review coming up uh, and take a look at some of that, that information out there. And so there's always new ideas, um, but never enough computing resources. Uh, we want to we some of the skill sets required to be a, a research meteorologist are, of course, programming skills, forecast, model and analysis, assessments. Uh, we have to have oral and written communication skills. We have to be able to effectively collaborate. That is one of the most key skills that we see today. You know, gone are the days where one author publications are the norm. Um, typically, you're working in and outside of your work unit with different organizations. Uh, and then the project management. You know, We want people that are able to manage their time, meet their milestones, meet their deliverables, all of those things. And that particular graphic uh, that, that was movie loop that was shown here was from GFDL, G the Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Laboratory. And that's of the FV3. And it's, it's, these are kind of the images that I saw when I was a student that made me enamored with numerical weather prediction because this isn't a satellite picture. It's actually a, a, a mathematical uh, simulation of the earth basically. And I thought that that was always fascinating. So if we go to the next slide, I wanna transition a little bit into kind of the, the science and policy aspect. And if you think back and take you, I wanna take you back and, and talk a little bit about the Hurricane Sandy, uh, um, forecast and how that heightened the visibility of weather prediction due to the large differences between the GFS and the ECMWF model runs. You know, people were starting, to, the, the blogosphere was really kind of jumping back in 2012 and 2013, um, where, you know, people like Cliff Mass were write, writing about the superiority of the European model. Uh, Cliff also talked about the computing power the need for more computing power here in the US. And then when you have people like Brian Williams and the nightly news covering numerical modeling, you know, that right there is at, we're, we're on a, a whole nother level and a whole nother level of dis, of visibility with respect to uh, our forecasts. And so our ability to communicate through social media, blogs, and through that 24-hour news cycle really changed the game uh, for, our, for our enterprise. So if you go to the next slide. And I wanna talk uh, quickly about you know, Dr. Bill LaPinta and the, the external review that occurred back in 2015 of the INSEP uh, modeling suite. Uh, Dr. LaPinta served as uh, became the director of INSEP back in 2013 after serving as the deputy. He was my boss when I was at the Environmental Modeling Center. Um, and Bill passed, if you didn't know, he passed in late September 2019. But if you really knew Bill, he was 
a person that really was never afraid of a difficult conversation. He wasn't afraid of making the difficult decisions. Uh, he knew really at that time that we had in some sense overextended our operational modeling suite, um, that we were doing too many things. And so in some sense, I think he knew that we needed to figure out a path forward for our operational modeling suite. And he brought in this committee uh, that could do that. Um, and I think Bill worked closely with NW, NWS leadership in order to seek some recommendations. So if you look at these recommendations on the left, you, you read through them, it's reduced complexity of the inset production suite. It is focused on collaborative collaboration for model development across NOAA. It's leveraging the capabilities of the external community. It's let's get some more high performance computing into our operations and our research suite. And then it's also focusing on strategy and implementation plans uh, based on the stakeholder needs. And you'll see in this next slide that all of this stuff basically aligned with the weather, weather research and forecasting innovation act of 20, 2017. And so the, the, this was the first legislation uh, for NOAA since 1992. And so that's, that's 27 years uh, that we didn't have any particular weather legislation. Um, and so in order to implement this legislation, what, it, what does it take? It takes, it takes leadership, it takes organizational, technological, and culture change throughout the agency. It takes money to implement this particular act as well. And so Craig McLean reminded us of that on Monday. And so the Weather Act, it mandates NOAA to do three things. And that's to advance the skill of our numerical models, to become international leaders in weather prediction, and to improve the research to operations process. So how should we actually accomplish these goals? The review committee um, recommendations from the previous slide totally align with what's on this particular slide. Collaborate internally and use existing resources provided to co co collaborate with the external community as well, build strong relationships between scientists and engineers, and then build a global community weather research model. And that takes us to the next slide. And so the UFS, the between the external review and the Weather Act legislation, we began to build plans that would implement those recommendations from the external review committee. Um, and at one point in 2016, if you really think about it, we were running probably close to 30 plus applications on the production suite. And we decided that we would move more towards a community modeling paradigm and to modernize the production suite. And that's where really the unified forecast system uh, comes in because the path that we were on was unsustainable. Now, in order to achieve this particular modernization effort, it really took collaboration between NOAA bringing together NWS centers and OAR laboratories uh, to map out a strategy that would support open access uh, to our weather prediction systems that would accelerate the R2O process at the same time. And so the UFS was born with many planning meetings to coordinate the development of this new, uh, new modeling system. And you may be thinking to yourself, okay, what is the UFS? Simply, it's basically a framework for Earth modeling that's designed as a research tool uh, that NWS operations will run in the production suite. Now, instead of those 30 applications that I talked about, we're, we're working towards simplifying that to about eight applications that focus on uh, sub-hourly, short-range, convective allowing model scale, um, numerical simulations, seasonal weather, space weather, air quality, um, hurricanes, as well as coastal applications. And so if you go to the next slide, we've achieved a lot um, through our UFS um, uh, activities over the last five or six years. Um, and on the left, you'll see a bunch of milestones. We've had two operational implementations of the GFS, Global Forecast System, with the new uh, finite volume uh, cubed 
uh, dynamic core. We've also had many partnerships uh, with the Joint Center for Satellite Data Assimilation, uh, and they recent, re recently released the, the Joint Effort for Data Integration uh, Data Assimilation System. Uh, we've had upgrades to our global ensemble system. Um, we've also had uh, an opportunity to reach out to the broader research community. And I think the research community is really excited about the releases that we've had with respect to our unified forecast system codes. Uh, our first release of the uh, UFS was in March of 2020, uh, where we released the me UFS medium range weather, which basically is like the global forecast system model. Um, and that's our first public release of an operational weather prediction system that was easily run on, I think it was around seven R&D computers. Uh, and I think you could also run it in the cloud as well. And so last month we released the UFS short range weather application. That's our, that's our high resolution model uh, that we're developing alongside with the community. And if you look at some of the stats on some of these releases uh, for our GitHub repository, it, it really does show consistent viewership and downloads of the code over the last year. And so there's over 12, 000, about 12,000 clones or downloads of the code. We've had over 60,000 views. People have forked over 120 times our code base. Um, and you know we're really excited too about all of the, the engagement that we're, we're seeing. And we're really ready to ramp up that engagement through the EPIC contract that was awarded to Raytheon Space, as, Space and Intelligence um, that provides user support services, training, cloud-ready UFS code, documenta documentation for the, for the UFS weather application, and also community engagement. And so if you go to the next slide, it, this brings us to EPIC, which I worked on. I think a lot of people in NOAA worked on. This was definitely one of the most integrated NOAA activities that we've had in a, that, I've, that I've actually experienced. And so EPIC was authorized by Congress uh, with the focus on partnering with the community. Um, EPIC had an $8 million budget uh, in, when it first started uh, in 2020. And then we moved up to a $13 million budget in, in uh, 20, 2021. And so um, the Earth Prediction Innovation Center really is gonna be a new paradigm for model development at NOAA and within the community. Uh, we're working closely with the external community for a more flexible framework for open innovation and open development. And we're, of course, we're partnering with the community uh, that's working on the unified forecast system uh, to support this modernization effort of the operational modeling suite. And so if we go to the next slide, I wanna talk a little bit about leadership and what that actually kind of really means to me. And if, you, if you've ever had any particular opportunity to apply to any kind of um, either program, whether it be at the undergrad, graduate or graduate level, there's always a little bit of doubt. There's always a little um, nervousness in applying to any of these programs. And so when, you, when, you, when I think about some of the jobs I've held after leaving the Environmental Modeling Center and getting accepted into a leadership development program, you know, I definitely didn't think I had a chance. I think I was probably one of the lowest paid persons, get people getting into this particular program. Um, but it taught me a lot of different things. And LCDP really taught me that really no matter what, make sure you put your name out there and put your name in the hat and just see what happens. You know, LCDP taught me that with a little time and patience, I can figure out most any job uh, that's presented in front of me. Um, you know, I've, I've never worked at HQ. I, I had never been a policy advisor. I had never been a program manager. But I took the necessary steps in order to prepare for those opportunities. LCDP taught me to really be comfortably uncomfortable, because when I'm when I'm comfortable, I think I, I take things for granted. I don't work as hard when I'm comfortable, and so being comfortably uncomfortable was is is a great space for me. And having these new opportunities uh, really helped me to to continue to grow in my career. 
And so I had the opportunity to work with Rick, Rick Spinrad. And what Rick taught me was about the five Ps. He taught me that proper preparation prevents poor performance. He was one of the most prepared people that I had ever worked with. Uh, I mean, absolutely prepared for every meeting uh, and, and, and doing just amazing things as a leader within the organization. And I remember on my first day in Rick's office, he, I come in, I come out of, you remember I'm mostly focused on, you know, developing numerical weather prediction models. And I come into a NOAA headquarters office and he said, and we're starting to talk about, you know, different priorities. And it's my first day in the office. And he asked me what, what, what are, what are my thoughts on this particular priority? And I was like, what? Um, I thought that I was learning and I was totally ill-prepared, but part of his leadership is being inclusive. Part of the entire leadership team that was at NOAA headquarters at that time was inclusivity. And it was one of the most diverse places that I, that I had ever worked. I mean, from Dr. Sullivan, to uh, the rest of her political staff. I mean, it was so much fun just, just seeing all of the different types of people that we were able to work with during that particular time. And one of the, the last stories I'll tell you is about uh, when Bill LaPenta, I was in LCDP and Bill LaPenta called me and said, Danae, I need you to go work for, uh, for NOAA headquarters. I need you to continue to stay down there. I was on that he called me on a Friday and on that Monday, I was supposed to report to the Office of Science and Technology Integration within uh, the National Weather Service. And I and he, he told me, hey, I need you to go do this. And I and I trusted Bill. Bill had already been a mentor to me. And I said, Bill, OK, I, I can I can do it. And I stayed down working for NOAA leadership during that particular time. And so that really changed my career. So if we go to the next slide. You know, I want to talk a little bit about traditional versus servant leadership, because that's one of the things that I truly learned about myself was that it really wasn't all about me. I wasn't a traditional leader. I didn't I wasn't trying to to seek, you know, power or control or, you know, I didn't measure my success through output. I really measured my success through how I was able to help other people. Um, how how can I um, drive engagement by supporting others? And how can I be a better listener? Uh, those were the things that really taught me. And if you hit click next, uh, one of the people that I learned, learned from is Vice Admiral Manson Brown. He taught me about being comfortably uncomfortable. Um, and he taught me about servant leadership. I remember one time I was in a NOAA leadership meeting and I was, I was up presenting and I was saying, I did this, I did that, I, 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 I. When I got back to Vice Admiral Brown's office, he sat me down. He said, what about all those other people that were working on, on that team that you were developing this d &I strategy on? And the crazy thing is I don't even remember saying I. And he noticed it, he called me out on it. And he let me know that there are so many other people that are working on these particular activities and goals and initiatives, and we need to be a we type of organization. And so I'll lastly say that Bill, one of the things that, uh, if you hit next, uh, one of the things that Bill did for me and showed his servant leadership uh, is through his ability to. He asked me to plan the Epic Community Workshop. We had about two months to plan this meeting. Uh, I just looked in my email. The first email came on June the 10th for, about the Epic Community Workshop. The, we actually had the workshop on August the 6th. And when, so we worked, it was a small team of us. We worked so hard to get this, um, this Epic Community Workshop together. And if you can see in this particular picture, I had to shout out Gina. Uh, uh, Esco, who's a big member of uh, AMS, uh, we devoted a lot of hours of planning uh, for this particular workshop. And Bill basically called me out uh, during that particular workshop, said how hard we all worked. It was a it was a team effort. It definitely was not me, 
Uh, but I, I really appreciate that from, from Bill. It's a, it's a moment that I always remember in my career. And so if you go to the next slide, hit next. Um, you know, support, you know, for me was extremely vital. Uh, you know, family support, having mentors, friends supporting me. I mean, th those are the only way that I'm actually here today, to be honest. You know, I, I, I honestly did not do much of uh, what I've done uh, in terms of my career, uh, you know, solo. It's been a lot of people really supporting me. And I, I would suggest to all of you guys continue to get your um, your 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 tribe together. If you hit the next slide, um, I just want to also say that opportunity is really important. You know, give me give we got to get always put our hat, our names in the hat, give ourselves a shot to prove other people wrong, um, to accept the challenges that are out there. Uh, many of you are the people that you're working with today. These are gonna be the exact same people you're gonna be working with 20 to 30 years from now. I promise you that. Most of these people that's in that picture on the right, I still see today. Either I talked to them or I have talked to them within the last three to four to five years. That's the day that I joined NOAA uh, back in 2002 and that's Vice Admiral uh, Leidenbacher. If you go to the next slide. Next, okay. Uh, representation matters. Um, hearing from diverse voices really matter. You look at this particular picture, there's three AMS presidents in this picture, there's White House advisors in this picture, there's heads of organizations in this picture. I mean, surround yourself by those people that inspire you and see, and you can see yourself climb and you can see yourself move in into all of these different spaces that you've never even thought of. I've never thought I would be doing some of these things. And then the last, last hit the last one, it's, it's all about action. People have to trust you. People, you have to be able to follow through on the things that are assigned to you. Um, you know, keep your word, get the things done that are required of you. And then again, all of you are well-trained. You're well-trained in critical thinking, problem solving, researching using the scientific method. Now apply those skills to any job that you have, any challenge that you're faced with, they will serve you, I mean, like unbelievably well in any kind of career that you choose. And then the next slide. So, you know, seeing the, the murder of George Floyd really did change America. It changed the conversation of the AMS. I really believe that. You look at what we've talked about this week. I've heard more about justice, equity, diversity, inclusion, more than I have in the last, what, maybe 20 years being an AMS member. Now we can see that these conversations are different. You know, I wanna applaud people like Dr. Vernon Morris, who basically is, you know, one of those pip people willing to take on that non-traditional student. Uh, Dr. Rick earlier was talking about it. Um, you know, he walked me through my PhD process. There's no way I would have a PhD without Dr. Vernon Morris. And he's actually walked 30 plus people, black and brown students through this process. He's actually changed the, he's actually changed the, the, the statistics of Hispanic atmospheric scientists being receiving their degrees in no emission related fields. 40% change, 50% change for African Americans associated to one person. So you, to me, you can't tell me that one person can't make a difference. So I'll end there and I appreciate your time and I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Danae, if we were sitting at the AAAS building right now, I think we would see a standing ovation. Thank, thank you so much for agreeing to speak on the virtual stage. We all know it's not easy to do this virtually. And the fact that you shared this in such an unscripted fashion, I think is what made it even better. Your authenticity was like shining throughout the whole thing. So thank you for that. Just a thank reminder you. to everyone. Um, if you have any questions for Danae and you're not shy, please post it in the chat. Uh, Danae, I do want to highlight where we're waiting for some questions to come in. 
uh, that uh, Eileen Shea wrote some wonderful words as well as Jen Sprague in regard to you're a born leader and your de presentation demonstrated why we all admire and respect you. And Jen also highlighted a similar feeling to I around your inspirational speech as well as your humility. And, and that's why we all love you so much. So see, look, I just see it. Some of the standing <laughs> ovation, people are standing at their destiny. <laughs> but it's such an honor. It really is. So hey, thank Danae, you I did have a I did have a quick question. Sorry, Heidi. I wanted to make sure that we all got those five P's. You said pre prepare. Pre proper, uh, pre proper preparation prevents poor performance. Thank you. Say that a few times real fast. We, Jen, you can post that in the chat. That would be wonderful. <laughs> I was, I was like, oh, I'm going to ask that question. Um, so in our, our few minutes left, Anae, um, I'm curious if, if, you know, being that we all are in this more virtual, even though we're mo moving back to in-person more, and I know some of how you've made your journey was through your connections and your interaction with people. Can you share any pointers for the students in early career as, as you navigate this new pathway that, that people are going to be joining, joining both of us on? I would I would encourage you all to to reach out. Um, you know, scientists love to talk. They especially love to talk about their science. They love to talk about their careers. Um, the question is, are you willing to learn? Are you willing to listen? Sit back and listen and learn and talk about uh, where you really want to go. Have a a plan for where you want to see yourself in the next five years. I. I for one, totally did not see myself living in Colorado. I did not see myself living in Hawaii, but those were the opportunities presented to me. Um, and those were the different spaces where I could really just have conversation um, and get an opportunity to just learn about, you know, how I can work in this particular environment. And so I put myself out there for these type of challenging situations. And it's not easy moving across the country, but it's an opportunity. And I, just, I, I felt that it was my duty to accept that opportunity. Thank you. Yeah, you're absolutely right, Danae. You know, it, don't, don't be afraid to be uncomfortable as you shared through your presentation and don't be afraid to taste risk because it's amazing the pathways that can open that least expect. And, and I had a similar situation as well. We do have a few questions that are popping in and I apologize in advance if I mispronounce anyone's name, you, you can slap me later on people. Uh, Tamara Battle uh, said, amazing inspirational presentation, Danae. Thank you for sharing. And her question is, was there ever a time when you found yourself discouraged with your progress and how did you shake yourself out of it? Great question. Um, I definitely was discouraged um, at the point when Bill Lapenta passed. I, that was probably one of the hardest times of my career uh, because I was dependent on Bill. I, Bill was the person that was going to really work on Epic and lead the effort for Epic. But what I realized is that after Bill passed, there were so many emails, so many text messages that I received that said, Danae, what do you need? What can I do for you? And just remember that whenever people go through something that's really traumatic, that there are other people that are willing to, that you can stand on their shoulders. You don't have to go through this, whatever that difficult time is by yourself. If, if nobody reaches out, then you reach out to them and say, can I talk to you about this so that you don't feel like you have to go at this, whatever it is, alone? Because I promise you, they're, they're, you have supporters. Uh, gr great insights, Sine. Uh, I want to, I think we have time for at least one or two more questions. Uh, Alexandra Grayson is asking, what skills developed and lessons learned in your early career would you say have been the most useful in the positions you hold today? I'd probably say I had to develop my people skills. I was, like I said, I was pretty shy, but eventually I learned that I was more of an extrovert, that I like being around people. Um, and Alexandra, you, I know who you are, you know me, you have those same skills of connecting with other people. Um, 
And I think that's the one thing that's probably helped me along the most. I have really good relationships with a lot of different people. Um, you know, if I called up Mike Farah today, I could talk to Mike Farah because I reached out to Mike Farah when I was a younger, um, a younger scientist and said, Mike, can I come sit down with you and talk about leadership? I bet you Mike would take my call today if I asked him for a meeting. Uh, excellent, Danae. I, I hate to say that we're out of time, everyone. There's still some questions in the chat. I'm going to see if we can grab those, Danae, so we can get them to you to help respond to everyone that's uh, made some wonderful comments and questions here. And I'm going to be thanking you again and passing the mic back to Jen to take us to break. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, right now, I can't tell you how, how appreciative I am, Danae, and just... Uh, Really took a lot of notes for myself as well and how to be a better servant leader and how to be more gracious and humble because you have set a great example for all of us at NOAA, but also within the AMS community. So thank you so much. Uh, next up, we have our keynote speaker uh, number five, Dr. Amanda Lynch, who will be talking with us, Science Communication Challenging Times at 1.15. So go take that quick break. We'll see you back here in 15 minutes. Thank you. <laughs> 